Hello, I am Bob Winans, Fondle's oldest son. Fondle kept several diaries during his early life. This video will only feature part of one of his early diaries. This diary includes mostly photographs with short comments for each shot. Fondle also had several type stories included with this diary. The one that I will tell you about today in Fondle's words is how to catch an alligator. All the marsh and swamplands that fringe the Gulf of Mexico on the north is a breeding place of the alligator. Here they exist in countless numbers, hatching out more young ones every year. To the casual explorer, a sight of the elusive amphibian is rarely accorded. During the winter months, he burrows himself deep in his hole, but summer brings him out of hibernation in search of food. Even then, he keeps himself well concealed at all times in almost unapproachable places and will completely disappear on the slightest provocation by withdrawing to his den or sneaking beneath the black swamp waters to remain longer than one would care to wait. The method used by our Cajun companions to capture the wily gator is employed at night. It is called shining. Shining gators is exciting sport as well as a means of livelihood to those who wrest existence from the somber swamp. The pintail, cabinet cruiser, towing a long skiff, transported us through the still jungle wall bayous, across the rippled six mile lake, and another network of narrow wooded waterways leading to Grand Lake. Night had fallen, but the spotlight picked out the old pool boat canal which leads east from Grand Lake to meet Little Bayou de Long in the forested swamp. Millions of tiny bugs attracted by the light beat themselves against the hot lenses. They flew in our eyes. We breathed them, even ate them. From the lilies jamming the banks came the intermittent croaking of frogs in chorus. Back in the woods, somewhere an owl hooted at intervals. M loomed out of the darkness ahead. It protruded from the water as high as a cabin. Father switched off the motor. We tied the pintail here. She could go no further. Her draft was three feet. We took to the skiff with shotguns and lamps. Father sat in the stern. Our native companions were two Cajun boys in the early 20s. One of them, the hunter, with his carbide lamp, set in the prow with me. The other rowed the boat, not as you and I would row it, but by standing up and propelling it forward by forward and downward movements of the handles, the angle of the blade changing at each stroke to shove the boat forward as propeller would. This manner of propulsion allowed the rower the most freedom of body movements and enabled him to row hour after hour with tireless effort. The boy at my side played the shaft of light from bank to bank as we progressed in the midstream. The black walls of the overhanging tangled foliage revealed nothing. They seemed even shrouded in unfathomable mystery. Giant cypress, eerily draped with long flowing stalactites of parasitic moss, reared their silhouetted flat tops far above the rank growth of the jungle. Numerous floating islands of hyacinths impeded our progress so that one of us would have to lie on his stomach on the prow and part a path through them with his hands. Some channels were so thickly choked that navigation of any sort was impossible. My eyes followed the shifting beam of light wherever it went, straining nervously for the blazing eyes of the alligator back and forth back and forth. My neck felt like a rubber band. Bayous intertwined, crossing and branching, so that I soon became totally lost. 
Father was equally bewildered. The Cajuns chuckled. They were at home. We made no noise except breathing. The oars dipped noiselessly in the inky water, then ceased suddenly for a moment. An alligator had been sighted. The headlight bearer pointed out the two fiery orbs a hundred yards ahead, below the bank in the black shadows of a jumble of palmettos. The skiff glided forward, seemingly drawn by the magnetic glare of the eyes. My breath came jerkily, but was well subdued. A weak feeling at my knees and a certain tautness about my chest reminded me that I had long looked forward to this tense moment. My partner now crawled forward to the prow, slowly, carefully, and training the light steadily on those burning eyes, prepared to grab it by the neck. The space between the eyes plainly told the size of the gator. The formula is simple. This particular pair of eyes were an inch and a half separated. Double this and you have the word three. Add the word feet to this result and you will have the gator's approximate length. Three feet. Of course, the alligator won't put up with any such nonsense as measuring between his eyes, so the hunter learns to judge inches approximately, thereby eliminating the possibility of grabbing one by the neck, which should really be shot. We were close enough now to see the details of the armored head of the reptile and the rank vegetation surrounding it. It lay quite still, staring doubtfully at the blinding light. But as the hunter reached forward, the beam of light fell upon his hand and the red eye disappeared. Not for long though, for the carbide lamp again picked the eyes out of the lured bayou. They were in mid-channel, moving away parallel to the bank. This time the weary hunter did not fail. He had both hands locked about the reptile's horny neck and although it was not a large one, it succeeded in lashing the water to foam with its sinuous tail. By the time we got it aboard, we were soaked for our pains. We tied the gator with a rope in the bottom of the skiff. In its fury, it was snapping those terrible jaws and emitting a series of grunts, not unlike those of a dog whining for a canine delicacy. In its frantic efforts to escape, it rolled over and over, twisting the rope to straining knots. It was twisted almost beyond endurance, and it seemed that our captive would commit suicide by choking himself. We relieved the strain every now and then by untying the leash and untwisting it when it got too knotted. For several days, the gators could not reconcile itself to the monotony of a galvanized wash tub, but now it basked in a luxurious mud puddle far from its native haunts in my backyard. There are two smaller gators for company in the same puddle. As partial atonement for their losses, I toss them a nice steak now and then, which they tear asunder and enjoy to the fullest. <laughs>